Mr. President. Senator from Kansas. Mr. President, on February 2nd, 2021, DHS Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas took an oath that all of us in this chamber have taken, an oath that many of us have taken that have served in the military, an oath to support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And here we are three years later in the worst border crisis our nation's ever seen. I rise today because we find ourselves at a critical moment in our nation's history, a moment when the integrity of this very chamber and its leadership is being tested, a time when we will see if our colleagues across the aisle are willing to do the right thing and hold Alejandro Mayorkas accountable for his dereliction of duty that has left our country of a shell of what she once was. Now, with over 11 million border crossings, including 2 million unvetted Godaways now living here on the United States soil, and amongst those are an unknown number of terrorists, vilest gang members, and drug cartels, Mayorkas has broken his oath, resulting in this dangerous and deadly invasion of our country. All you have to do is read your hometown news, and you're going to find a person in your community that's died from fentanyl or that's been physically abused or murdered by one of these unvetted illegal aliens. From the moment Secretary Marcus took office, he has skirted the Constitution and broken the law as outlined in the Secure Fence Act of 2006, which clearly states he must maintain operational control and to quote that same law, prevent unlawful entries into the United States. In the past three years alone, we've had nearly two million known Godaways successfully evade capture and enter our country, a number that includes hundreds of violent gang members and terrorists. And to put that into perspective, the scale of this issue today, over 800 Godaways will illegally cross into this country. Yesterday, over 800 unvetted Godaways escaped into our country, and tomorrow, 800 more unvetted aliens will end up here on the United States soil, living in communities around the country. Now, maybe that's why law enforcement officers recently told me back home that we cannot arrest ourselves out of this crisis, that they are so overwhelmed by crime now related to these illegal crossings, we cannot arrest ourselves out of this predicament. Now, Secretary Mayorkas has given free reign to drug cartels to smuggle in illegal aliens and deadly drugs like fentanyl, resulting in the deaths of 300 Americans every day, with a total of over 250,000 fentanyl-related poisoning murders, deaths occurring under his watch. That's three times more than the number of brave soldiers we lost in the Vietnam War. Three times more. The Secretary has turned a blind eye to the exploitation of our borders by terrorists, Chinese nationals, and other high-risk individuals, causing the largest influx of terrorist border crossings in our nation's history. And let us not forget the abuse and weaponization of parole and asylum. Secretary Mayorkas has illegally admitted nearly 800,000 aliens per year, 800,000 under this parole, compared to just 5,000 per year under President Obama or President Trump. 800,000 versus 5,000 5, a year. There's no question that the situation at our borders is dire, and the responsibility of this historic crisis lies squarely at the feet of those who have failed to address it. Instead of fulfilling his obligation to the American people, Secretary Mayorkas has unraveled our national security, unleashed our border into chaos, and launched an unmitigated disaster and culture of lawlessness that has left Lady Liberty vulnerable to exploitation. His actions, or lack thereof, his actions have endangered the safety of every American, and there must be consequences. Congress must step in and do the job that President Biden refuses to do and fire Secretary Mayorkas. Enough is enough. Americans deserve better. We are here today because we take our oath seriously. With the House managers delivered the articles of impeachment to the Senate chambers today, I hope our colleagues across the aisle, who also took an oath to protect and defend our great nation, will do the right thing. Let's bring this to a trial. 
Let's debate his record. And for the sake of America's safety and security, let's impeach Alejandro Mayorkas. Taking this decisive action will send a clear message to this administration. They'll be held accountable for orchestrating this deadly invasion. Thank you. Mr. President, I yield back. Mr. President. Senator from Wisconsin. Mr. President, uh, earlier today we heard a very convincing case laid out by the House managers of why the Senate should fulfill its constitutional duty and proceed to a trial on the impeachment of Secretary Mayorkas. Uh, if we were to hold that trial, and we should do so, uh, this chart that I've been developing since I became Chairman of Homeland Security in 2015 would, would basically be the irrefutable DNA evidence of the crime. Uh, what I've tried to lay out in this chart is the cause and effect of an ongoing set of illegal immigration crises faced by the last three administrations. And so what I'd like to do briefly here on the Senate floor is go through that history dating back to 2012 and show the impact of certain actions, certain court decisions, uh, certainly the, the lack of faithfully executing the law in this administration that has now resulted in an invasion of our countries. But let's go back to uh, 2012. That's where this chart begins. Even before that, I, I had developed a chart just showing on an annual basis the number of unaccompanied children coming to this country averaged for many years, somewhere between two, three, four thousand a year. And then in June of 2012, President Obama issued his what I would consider lawless, unlawful, deferred action on childhood arrivals. That is what has sparked all the succeeding immigration, illegal immigration crises, is that unlawful order. Uh, which, which by, by the way, was a complete misuse of prosecutorial discretion, which is supposed to be meted out or administered on a case-by-case -case basis. And for the first time, President Obama and his administration granted prosecutorial discretion to hundreds of thousands of people. And the world took note. What, what happened over the in, intervening years then is people realized America's law has changed. And we had reports when, you, when people would come to this country illegally, they would get their notice to appear before an immigration court. Well, that was used by human traffickers down in Central America. They called that the permiso, the permission slip to come to this country. So a couple of years after that unlawful order, Deferred Action on Childhood Arrivals, President Obama faced his border crisis. He actually called it a humanitarian crisis when in May, of June, May and June of 2014, they averaged about 2,200 encounters per day. 2,200. That seems like the good old days. That's, that's that little bump in comparison to President Biden's crisis at the border. So President Obama actually took action. He started detaining family units with children that came across the border, and it worked. He brought down the number of people crossing this into our country illegally because there was a consequence to it. Unfortunately, in February 2015, pro-immigration immigration groups took the Obama administration to court under the Flores settlement, which, which basically back in the 1990s, uh, there's a court case with a young immigrant girl named Flores. Uh, and the result of that settlement said that DHS could not hold an unaccompanied child for more than 20 days. Again, an unaccompanied child. So the Obama administration interpreted that, well, we can certainly hold a child when they're detained with their family. Well, these, again, pro-illegal immigration groups took uh, 
the Obama administration to court, took Secretary Jay Johnson to court, and they reinterpreted the Flores settlement and said, no, you can't detain a child even if they're accompanied by their parents. And so the Obama administration faced a real decision. Uh, should we detain the parents and release the child into HHS custody? They chose not to do that, except in some situations where they felt the, that wasn't a real family unit and that those parents may be uh, a danger to that child. And you can see that the result of that, basically catch and release is what that resulted in. And you can see the numbers start increasing prior to President Trump taking office. Now, if you remember, President Trump in his, during his election made the open border, that catch and release, a, a, a huge issue in the campaign. And so when he got elected, again, the world noticed. They felt there's going to be a real crackdown on illegal immigration, and they stopped coming. There's a huge reduction from the end of the, the Obama administration to when President Trump first took office. But unfortunately, the law didn't change. That Flores reinterpretation stood. And so President Trump was faced with trying to figure out how, how can he utilize what, what laws existed, what authority he had, with no help from Congress, to address this situation. He wasn't able to address it immediately. And as a result, you can see the increase of not only single adults, but family units exploiting that provision, and unaccompanied children. To the point where in May of 2019, he hit his high point. Almost 5,000 people per day. But you'll notice President Trump did something about it. He enacted migrant protection program. He instituted safe third country agreements with countries in Central America. He had to threaten the president of Mexico with tariffs so the president of Mexico would cooperate with us in securing our border. And over the next 12 months, President Trump, by and large, secured the border. To hit a low point in April of 2020, when a little more than 500 people per day were trying to come into this country illegally. Now, what President Trump also had starting in March of 2020 during the, the pandemic, remember, all of this reduction in illegal immigration occurred before the pandemic, but once the pandemic was in full swing in March and April of 2020, President Trump used his authority under Title 42 and use that health emergency to start deporting people coming to this country illegally. So you can see the very small, the, the purple bar are the people expelled using Title 42 authority. So even though the number of single adults was rising, by the way, the reason they were rising is during the presidential debate of 2020, every Democrat presidential candidate said they're going to end deportations and offer free health care. So again, that, that's the signal. The world listens to what elect, elected officials or potentially elected officials say, and they believe them. They also believe their eyes when once people start coming in here, they're either detained and expelled or they're not detained. But anyway, so people started coming into this country again, assuming that President Biden was going to win the election and the border would be opened up. And of course, that's exactly what happened. Because once President Biden took office, he used the exact same executive authority that President Trump used. Let me just quick cover that. Even after the Flores reinterpretation, the Supreme Court in a ruling in 2018 said that existing law, even though it was weakened by that reinterpreted, re re reinterpreted Flores decision or settlement, that the, that the current law exudes deference to the executive branch. President Trump used that deference. President Trump used that executive authority and pretty well closed the border. President Biden came into office and with literally hundreds of executive actions, completely reversed President Trump's successful border security measures using that exact same presidential authority. All that deference. But the point that's important to understand is President Biden wanted an open border. He caused this crisis. He could end it if he wanted to. He still has the authority. Republicans in the Senate would be happy to strengthen that authority, 
to overturn this Flores reinterpretation, which, by the way, Secretary Jay Johnson opposed that reinterpretation. He didn't like that court decision. So we would have been happy to strengthen President Biden's authority, but he doesn't really need us to, to secure the border. That's the point. And again, here's the DNA, the irrefutable DNA evidence of the crime. This didn't have to happen. President Biden didn't have to reverse President Trump's successful border security executive orders. But he reversed them and he opened up the border. And the result now is probably more than six million people have come to this country illegally and stayed. That's a number greater than the population of 31 states. That's the order of magnitude of the problem. The impact of this open border policy is devastating. It is a catastrophe. Not only does this open border policy facilitate the multi-billion dollar business model of some of the most evil people on the planet, the human traffickers, the sex traffickers, the drug traffickers. How many hundreds of thousands of Americans have died of fentanyl overdoses? You know, President Biden and Secretary Morocco said that they're reversing all of Trump's border security provisions because they said it was inhumane. There's nothing humane about facilitating human and sex and drug trafficking. And of course, the migrants coming in this country, it is true, Venezuela is emptying their jails, their mental institutions. There are some bad people, there are some criminals coming in this country, and of course, we see evidence with these migrant crimes, horrific crimes. People who, who no longer are alive because of President Biden's open border policies, because of Secretary Mayorka executing President Biden's open border policies. Now, I'm not a lawyer, I'm not a prosecutor, but, but I believe it's a crime to aid and abet other crimes. So, from my standpoint, I think the House managers ought to be allowed to make their case. Again, they laid out a very compelling, the very compelling articles of impeachment today. It's a pretty simple case. It probably won't take that long of time for them to make their case, to present it for the Senate. Why won't, why won't Majority Leader Schumer allow the House managers to make their case? Why won't he allow the Senate to fulfill its constitutional duty to try impeachment. So listen, impeachments are not that regular. The least we can do is fulfill that constitutional duty and listen to the evidence. Allow the House managers to make their case. I think their case is overwhelmingly convincing. The repercussions of President Biden and Secretary Mayorkas' open board policy will be felt by Americans for years, if not decades, to come. About the only thing Congress can do when a president or a member of the executive branch is not faithfully executing the laws, when they're completely derelict in their duty, when their dereliction of duty or the lack of faithfully executing the laws is resulting in the deaths of Americans Again, the open border policy is resulting in the deaths of American citizens. It's resulting in young women being forced into the sex trafficking trade. It's resulting in higher levels of fentanyl overdoses. That evidence needs to be heard. That case needs to be made. The Senate should hold a trial. With that, Mr. President, I yield the floor. Mr. President. Senator from Florida. Mr. President, I will get to the issue of Secretary Mayorkas' impeachment in a moment. I'd first like to speak to Iran's attack on Israel this weekend. We all saw what happened on Saturday evening. Israel is once again under attack. 
this time under direct attack from Iran. And the United States must clearly and strongly stand with our great ally and fully support its right and obligation to defend itself by any means necessary. I was just in Israel a few weeks ago to meet with Prime Minister Netanyahu and see the terror and devastation that Iran-backed Hamas terrorists unleashed on the Jewish state on October 7th firsthand. More than 1,200 were murdered, and hundreds are still being held hostage by Hamas just for being Jewish. Americans are, the, are, are, Americans are among the hostages and those murdered that day. The horrors of that attack are difficult to describe and can never, ever happen again. Today, I continue to pray for the safety of the Israeli people and call on every Republican and every Democrat to stand unequivocally with Israel as it fights for its very existence against evil terrorism. Mr. President, again and again, Democrats have blocked the passage of aid for Israel. Democrats have blocked Israel aid four times in the U.S. Senate. The House has passed a good bill that is ready for Senate passage right now. I urge Majority Leader Chuck Schumer to immediately put the House passed Israel aid bill on the floor, as well as my Stop Taxpayer Funding Hamas Act tonight. Nothing before the Senate is more important. And I will do everything in my power to make sure that vote happens as soon as possible. Let's all remember who the enemy is here and has always been. The evil and terror-supporting regime in, in Iran. Since its first days, the Biden administration has emboldened Iran with appeasement, freeing billions upon billions of dollars to fuel Iran's support of terrorism, and turning its back on Israel. Israel is the only democracy in the Middle East and one of America's strongest allies. But it took President Biden months to meet or speak with Prime Minister Netanyahu after he took office. And unfortunately, the world took notice. Since October 7th, President Biden and Democrats in Washington have continued to undermine Israel's fight against Iran-backed Hamas terrorists further isolating our ally in its greatest time of need. And here's where we're dealing with here at home this week. America and the freedom-loving nations of the world are less safe and secure because of President Biden's weakness and appeasement of evil regimes and the terror each support. That is a fact that the FBI director confirmed when I questioned him in the Homeland Security Committee last year. And the terrifying truth is that while President Biden's weakness has emboldened our enemies, Secretary Mayorkas has shown that he will do absolutely nothing to stop evil people from invading our country through our southern border and launching attacks on the U.S. homeland. This isn't some hypothetical nightmare. nightmare. The possibility of an attack by terrorists on U.S. soil is something that FBI and U.S. intelligence community are terrified about. The threats are, are all up. We know terrorists are coming into America because of the wide open southern border. That is a fact. America is a more dangerous place because Mallorcas and Biden have, have allowed criminals, drugs, terrorists, and other dangerous people into our communities. There are real consequences to this failure to secure the border, and each victim has a name. Real Americans with families are being killed. Real American families are being torn apart by vicious crimes and deadly drugs because we have a wide open border. Innocent Mer Americans like Lake and Riley are paying the ultimate price for Mallorca's failure. 10 million people have illegally crossed and 6 million have been allowed to stay and had the red carpet rolled out for them courtesy of the American taxpayer. There have been sexual assaults and murders committed by illegal aliens all across this country. Even in my home state of Florida where a young man was recently killed. The man charged for his death is an illegal alien. 
Now, because of these failures, the Republican majority in the House has voted to impeach Mayorkas for violating his oath of office. They took their time. They got the evidence. They made the decision to impeach. Whether anyone in this chamber here believes that that was right or wrong, that happened, and we should now hold a trial to let Mayorkas make his case. That is our constitutional duty. But unlike what happened in 2019, when Democrats alone voted to impeach the president and Republicans controlled the Senate, Majority Leader Chuck Schumer is going to deny Secretary Mayorkas the ability to defend himself in a trial. He will not have the ability to defend himself in a trial. It seems to me that the majority leader doesn't want to let Mayorkas defend himself in a trial for one of two reasons. The majority leader is either acting out of pure political interest to protect his incumbent members who don't want to talk about Mayorkas' record and the wide open border he has created and all the crimes, drugs, and the illegal immigration it's allowing. Or the majority leader is just tired of a ter- trial exposing Mayorkas' failure to a degree that acquittal will be extremely painful for the Democrats to explain to the American people. Here's, here's what I don't understand. Democrats voted against a bill to stop illegal aliens from getting on a commercial flight with no verifiable, verifiable ID. You have to, they don't. Democrats voted against deporting illegal aliens who hurt police. And Democrats voted against the Lake and Riley Act, which simply requires ICE to take illegal aliens who commit crimes into custody before tragedy strike. So it seems to me that Democrats have no problem voting to keep the board, this border crisis going and blocking every attempt that Republicans make to stop the crime and secure the border. But when it comes to Secretary Mayorkas, they shut everything down and don't let them speak. Secretary Mayorkas is a former prosecutor. Surely he knows how to handle himself. to present to the American people on why he should not be found guilty. But he's not going to get that chance. And Senate Democrats are setting a dangerous precedent and destroying the rules and traditions of the Senate to keep Mayorkas silent. I have one question. Is Mayorkas being silenced because Democrats are terrified of his record and unable to defend him or because they don't trust him? Whatever the answer might be, I urge my Democrat colleagues to get over the discomfort that is causing them and do what is right for the safety of American families. The events of this weekend have shown once again that the world is a much more dangerous place under President Biden's failed leadership. If Democrats put politics over the safety of American families and the security of our great nation, I fear the consequences will be devastating beyond our worst fears. I want everybody to stop for one moment. Just talk about Think about their families. Think about their mom or their dad or their sister or brother, their wife. Think about their children or their grandchildren or their nieces and nephews. Since Biden took office, people like that, just like your family that you love and cherish, people like that, here's what's happened to them. Some have died of drug overdoses. Some have been raped. Some have been murdered. Some have been sold into, uh, to, you know, to uh, slavery, basically. It's devastating. I don't know how anybody could sit there and not care about people just like their mom, their dad, their brother, their sister, their spouse their children or their grandchildren or their nieces and nephews. But that is exactly, that's exactly what's going on here when we do not have the opportunity to hold Mayorkas accountable. Thank you, Mr. President. I yield the floor. Mr. President. Senator from Alabama. Thank you, Mr. President. The House managers have officially delivered the letters of impeachment for Department of Homeland Security Secretary Secretary Mayorkas of the Senate. Now is the time for every senator to go on record. 
Do you think Mayorkas has done a good job at the border? Has Mayorkas fulfilled the oath he swore before this body protect and to defend our country against all threats, foreign and domestic? Is our border secure? The answer is simple. Mayorkas has intentionally failed to do his job. Now, Senator Schumer and the globalist Democrats have the opportunity to conduct a full and a fair trial before the entire Senate and the public. Unfortunately, that's not how this is going to play out. Democrats are going to try to table the articles of impeachment, which has never been done in the history of the Senate. They're going to attempt to sweep the border crisis that President Biden has created under the rug. Every single House Democrat voted to save Milwaukee's job. They endorsed our wide open borders that have allowed terrorists, drug traffickers, and murderers into our country. <clears throat> Democrats are lying to themselves and risking the lives of every American. Senator Schumer and the Democrats can't say they want to fix our borders while voting to save Mayorkas's job. Mayorkas has been derelict in his duty to secure the border in the three years he's been on the job. Our border is the least secure it has ever been. In fact, it's almost non-existent. Our Border Patrol agents are so overwhelmed and receive such little support from the Biden administration to enforce our laws that they have been forced to release millions of illegal immigrants into the United States. And those who are released on parole, they're even given work permits. The Biden administration is more concerned with taking care of illegal aliens than they are about protecting American citizens. We might as well start mailing every criminal, drug trafficker, and terrorist an open invitation to cross our borders. I've spoken numerous times on this floor to highlight stories of Americans who have died at the hands of illegal aliens. Their tragic deaths are a direct result of Secretary Mayorkas' inaction. Mayorkas and Joe Biden have blood on their hands. The most important responsibility of any sovereign nation is the safety of its citizens. Yet, what did the Democrat Homeland Security announce just last week? They plan on sending another $300 million to communities receiving illegal aliens from this border crisis. The top priority of this administration is to let as many people in as quickly as possible, regardless of how many American lives are lost in the process. <coughs> the number of people crossing into the U.S. are on the terrorist watch list, and that's unprecedented. Just last week, it was reported that an Afghan on the FBI terror watch list has been in the U.S. for almost a year. He is a member of a U.S. designated terrorist group responsible for the deaths of at least nine Americans, and there are American soldiers, by the way, and civilians in Afghanistan. ICE arrested him in San Antonio just this past February. Unfortunately, this known terrorist has been released on bond. He's now roaming our neighborhoods. You know, it just isn't terrorists we have to worry about. Fentanyl flowing freely across our borders, and it's killed hundreds of thousands of Americans. Not thousands, hundreds of thousands. Law enforcement officers in my state of Alabama tell me time and again how their officers must wear heavy equipment, carry Narcan spray to protect themselves from fentanyl, that is pouring into our communities. And by the way, most will tell you they never heard of fentanyl until this administration came into power. <coughs> Despite the critical need to secure our borders and discourage illegal immigration, Mayorkas has been traveling the world. Yes, this Mayorkas, traveling the world, lecturing other countries about their national security while his refusal to enforce U.S. laws has exposed his own country to an invasion. It's embarrassing. In February, he traveled to Austria 
to speak with Chinese officials about counter-narcotic efforts. Did he discuss with them the flood of Chinese illegal immigrants coming to the U.S. through the southwest border? 22,000 Chinese nationals have been arrested by Border Patrol agents at the southwest border since October of last year and released into our country. Most of these individuals are single adult male military age. <clears throat> Yet the media tries to act like all these people crossing the border are innocent women and children. Now some of them are, but most are not. This invasion is more than a border crisis. It is a national crisis. And yet, I seriously doubt Mayorkas even brought up the point in his meeting with these Chinese officials. In February, he was in Germany for the Munich Security Conference. The Munich Security Conference is the largest international security meeting in the world. Mayorkas was there giving speeches on strengthening global security and partnerships. Meanwhile, the border he is responsible for is wide open and thousands of people are dying. Give me a break. Our allies must be laughing at us, absolutely laughing. The Secretary's priorities should be here in our country, securing our borders, pr protecting our citizens. President Biden has made the U.S. a joke around the world. This administration, under this administration, nearly 10 million people have invaded our country. Every state is now a border state, every state. This is not a gray area. Secretary Mayorkas has intentionally failed to do his job. He has personally lied to me to my face three times in the last three years. A United States senator, just tell me the truth. He can't say the truth. He can't tell you the truth. To my Democratic colleagues, have you read the heartbreaking stories of innocent Americans who have been murdered by illegal aliens? Are you concerned? Are you concerned about the safety of your spouses, your kids, your nieces, nephews, does it worry you that hundreds of terrorists are flooding our country? Does that bother you at all? Do you know someone who has died of fentanyl, which was trafficked, by the way, by cartels from other countries? This isn't about politics, folks. Our national security and our country's future is at stake. Americans deserve to know the truth about how Secretary Mayorkas has intentionally failed to secure the border. I will be voting to hold Mayorkas accountable. Mr. President, I yield the floor. Mr. President. Senator from Utah. Mr. President, we have a job to do. That job is not optional. It's assigned to us by the United States Constitution, a document to which we've all sworn an oath under Article 1, Section 3, Clause 6. The Senate has the power, and I would add here, the duty to try all impeachments. Not just some impeachments, not just those impeachments with which the majority party feels really happy about looking into, but all impeachments. It's the way it's always been in United States history. When the House sends over articles of impeachment, if we have jurisdiction, which we clearly, plainly do here, it is our job to conduct a trial. What do I mean by that? Well, it's a, really a simple concept. In articles of impeachment, an accusation is made. Our job is to just decide whether that accusation is meritorious or not. Whether the thing that has been accused is legitimate. Whether the person who's been accused did the thing that was wrong committed the high crime or misdemeanor spoken of in the Constitution. So we have a job to do, and it's a job that the Senate has always done when we have jurisdiction following the adoption of Articles of Impeachment. Now, let's remember, this is an historic day. This hasn't happened very often. This is only the 22nd time in American history in which Articles of Impeachment have been adopted by the House. And in this circumstance, where we clearly, plainly have jurisdiction, there's no valid basis for us to do anything other than to decide whether the accusations are legitimate. We have to do that. We don't have the luxury of simply standing back and saying, ah, oh, we don't want to handle it. Now, I, I know, I know, the Senate has found ways 
of shirking its responsibility over and over and over again in all of the operations of the Senate's work. Sometimes, most of the time, we sit as a legislative body where we consider legislation. We pass law or decline to do so. Other times we sit in an executive capacity where we review presidential nominations uh, to consider them on whether we should confirm them and also consider treaties. That's in an executive capacity. We also sometimes sit as a court of impeachment. Now, in other areas, the Senate's found ways of shirking its responsibilities. We've handed off a whole lot of the lawmaking power to unelected, unaccountable bureaucrats in the executive branch. In our executive capacity, we have whittled down the number of executive branch nominees that are subject to Senate confirmation, even as the total volume of those individuals has increased. And now it seems we're determined yet again to whittle down our responsibilities in the one area where we have an affirmative duty, an affirmative obligation, an affirmative command within the Constitution requiring us to make a decision. In the immortal words of Rush, in one of my favorite Rush songs of all time called Free Will, if you choose not to decide, you still have made a choice. And yet that is what Senate Democrats are planning to ask us to do within 24 hours ask us to not decide, ask us to take these accusations and these articles of impeachment, duly passed by a majority of the House of Representatives, the body in the Congress that has the sole power to impeach. It's not just 218 plus random people who decided to make the accusation against Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas, who heads the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. No, it's those particular 218 plus people in the House of Representatives who have that power. You see, there's a reason why the impeachment power belongs exclusively to the House of Representatives. The House of Representatives is within the legislative branch, the branch of the federal government most accountable to the people at the most regular intervals. And within the Congress, within the legislative branch, they are the body most accountable to the people at the most regular intervals. That's why they call it the People's House. They are the only ones entrusted with this power. And a majority of them, of that 435 member body, has concluded that Alejandro Mayorkas must be impeached. Now, they didn't do it for light and transient reasons. They didn't do it because of a policy disagreement. No, a majority of the House of Representatives has chosen to impeach Secretary Mayorkas for the reason that he has affirmatively defied the commands of federal law. The laws in particular that he is charged with administering. They've identified at least seven or eight different provisions of the Immigration and Nationality Act, including sections 235B2A and 235B1B2 and 236C and 236A and 212D5A, just to mention a few of them. These articles of impeachment outline myriad instances in which Secretary Mayorkas has been commanded decisively unambiguously to detain illegal immigrants pending one action or another, pending one determination or another as to their eligibility, either for immigration parole or for asylum or for something else. He's required to detain them, and he didn't detain them. Just a few examples of uh, the many things that he's done and direct contravention to a direct command by the law. And it's not just that he didn't do the things that he was commanded to do, it's that he did the exact opposite of those things. He was commanded, for example, not to exercise his immigration parole authority under 212 D5A. He's not allowed to do that categorically. He's allowed to do that only for discrete, individualized, particularized circumstances in which there is a profound, pronounced, humanitarian, or public need. And yet, he issued all these categorical parole orders, 
creating categorical immigration parole programs, allowing for literally hundreds of thousands of people a year to be brought into this country lawlessly, without documentation, without just cause to be brought into the United States. He made illegal immigrants legal by violating the affirmative command of the law. It's not yet clear exactly what form the arguments presented by the Democrats tomorrow will take. But we do know this, whether they call it a motion to dismiss or a motion to table, they want to not decide something that has to be decided by order of the Constitution by the Senate. These accusations are real, Mr. President. They make a difference. They make a difference to the American people. These crimes, or I should say high crimes and misdemeanors, of which Secretary Mayorkas has been accused. These are not victimless crimes. Far from it, Mr. President. These are offenses that have resulted in millions. On the low end, it's maybe seven or eight million. On the high end, it's more like 12, 13, or 14 million. People who have come into this country unlawfully since January 20th, 2021, when the administration of Joe Biden has willfully, intentionally brought people into this country who aren't supposed to be here, who aren't allowed to be here. And it's not just the addition of those sheer numbers of people. It's the fact that among those people are many thousands of military-aged Chinese males. Many millions of military-aged males from other countries, including hundreds of suspected terrorists, including thousands who come from countries that we pay close attention to because we know those countries are full of a lot of people who are bent on acts of lawlessness, violence, and terrorism against the United States of America. And this, of course, is just the beginning. This says nothing about the countless neighborhoods and schools and communities and jobs and lives that have been lost or violated or rendered unsafe or all of the above as a result of those who have been brought in, not just with the acquiescence of, but at the invitation of and with the assistance of the Secretary of Homeland Security, the very man whose job it is to protect us from those very things and who has very specific orders that he follows, orders that have been put into law by the Congress of the United States. Now, he's breaking the law over and over and over again, specifically to allow for illegal immigration. So the Democrats are expected to come along tomorrow and say, yeah, but we don't want to have to decide this. We don't want to have to decide it because, well, it's an election year. President Biden's on the ballot. This is already an area where he's not doing well. And we've got other members of this body, including, you know, a certain senator from Montana, for example, or maybe a certain senator from Ohio, for example, or a senator from Pennsylvania, uh, uh, among others who are going to be up for re-election. Sure, they'd rather not have to address this. I understand why they'd rather be doing something else, anything else other than this. They would rather reorganize their sock drawer. Some of them would probably much rather have a root canal or another painful procedure without anesthesia than they would have to focus on this. But alas, the Constitution is agnostic as to your sock reorganization days. The Constitution doesn't care how often you go to the dentist and whether you get a root canal with or without anesthesia. But you know, the Constitution does care about one thing. In particular, very relevant here today. And that is that the Senate is to try all impeachments. This is an impeachment. We have to try it, particularly in the absence of the case being rendered moot by a vacancy in office or death or otherwise, circumstances that are noticeably absent here. We have the duty to do this. And what happens when we don't? What happens if they get their way and they choose either to table or to dismiss or use some other fancy word to try to avoid doing their job? What happens? Well, more deaths occur. Deaths like the tragic passing of Lake and Riley, who was taken from us just a few weeks ago 
as a result of Secretary Mayorkas' lawless conduct along the border. But for his lawless conduct and his cavalier treatment of the law, in fact, his defiant refusal to abide by the law, and in fact, his dogged determination to break the law, Lake and Riley would have still been alive. Countless others who have uh, uh, undergone uh, horrific events within their families, murders, rapes, sexual assaults, robberies, drunk driving, all kinds of horrific trauma that the American people have endured. Now, some of that's going to happen from people who live here already. We shouldn't add to that, Mr. President, by bringing in others who shouldn't be here to begin with. This is exactly the kind of thing that our immigration laws are designed to protect against. Now, as one who spent two years living and working along our southern border, living and working among and with the poorest of the poor, including many immigrants themselves, recent immigrants in many cases, I can tell you there's no group of people who has more cause to fear uncontrolled waves of illegal immigration than recent immigrants themselves, including and especially the poor who live on or near a border. It is their jobs, it is their families, it is their schools, it is their neighborhoods, it is their homes that are most directly put in jeopardy every single time we fail. Or in the case of Secretary Mayorkas, we adamantly refuse to obey and enforce the law. And we do everything that we can to undermine it, as he has done. There is no set of arguments I can imagine. I look forward to hearing what arguments might be had tomorrow, might be presented tomorrow. It could be presented with any kind of a straight face that could say, we need not address the merits of this accusation, because there are none. Perhaps they will argue that this is an accusation amounting to mere uh, uh, maladministration. He didn't do a good job. Well, that's not at all what we have here. Even if that is what we had here, that still wouldn't mean that they didn't have to try the case and come up with an answer as to whether or not he did what they said he did. Look, the impeachment power goes back uh, some you know, two and a half centuries to the dawn of the Republic. Nearly two and a half centuries ago, when we became a country, we relied heavily on the legal systems, the tradition, and in some cases the terminology used in England. And in, during the early years of the Republic, we had uh, uh, individuals who were familiar with our Constitution, who were also uh, familiar, having practiced in the law at the time of the Revolution, in some cases before then, they knew the meaning of these words. Supreme Court Justice Joseph Story was one of those individuals who lived, practiced, and wrote at and after the time of the American Revolution, during the early decades of our young republic. And he explained that, among other things, uh, an impeachment uh, could be found. A high crime and misdemeanor could be committed where, for, for instance, a Lord Admiral, Admiral was found to have neglected the safeguard of the sea. It's perhaps the most directly analogous comparison he makes to the Secretary of Homeland Security. That would be, uh, you know, best described perhaps as a dereliction of duty, a failure to do one's job. If that, uh, a Lord Admiral neglecting the safeguard of the sea, if that was a high crime and misdemeanor, it follows for sure. It be, it's, it's even more certain that the Secretary of Homeland Security, having defied more than a half dozen direct commands of federal law and done the exact opposite of those things, has also committed a high crime and misdemeanor. Now, maybe some in this body disagree. Maybe some in this body believe that the facts are different than they have been alleged here. Well, that, Mr. President, that's what a trial's for. That's why we don't just take the word of the House of Representatives for it. We, we do our job over here. We have to review the accusation, and we have to review it against the backdrop of what arguments and evidence they present to us. We're going to be sworn in tomorrow at 1 p.m. to be finders of fact and to be judges of law 
relevant to the impeachment accusation. If we decide not to decide, we still have made a choice. We shouldn't do that here. Doing that here would be a dereliction of duty. Doing that here would be profoundly disrespectful to the hundreds of millions of Americans who elected us, and especially to the families of those, like the family of Lake and Riley and countless others whose lives have been permanently and tragically disrupted by the lawlessness exhibited by Secretary Mayorkas. We must do our job. We must hold the trial. That trial must culminate in a finding of guilt or innocence. The Constitution and our commitment to it requires nothing less. Thank you, Mr. President. I yield the floor.